In the 50s, with the threat of television looming, Hollywood had to change up their game. Wider screens, longer epics, bigger budgets, and even bigger sets. New ideas, new talent, new iterations of that old boring silent stuff. Forget the past, we gotta make money. Billy Wilder knew the dirty secrets of Hollywood, so he decided to make a movie about it. 1950s Sunset Boulevard. To all you out-of-work soda jerks without a penny to pinch. To the detectives with all the answers. To the dastardly dames who play men like baby dolls. And the trusted ones too pure for this world. And all you double-crossing, backstabbing, ruthless, baby-faced amateurs. This one's for you. So suit up, turn out the lights, put the match to your smokes, and sit back for the darker side of things. Sin a shadow moonlights, noir vimper. We first get a shot of a street sign, Sunset Boulevard, a place of old Hollywood known for its beauty and grandeur. The camera moves down the street, then pans up to show the police speeding down it. We follow the policeman as the camera pans to show a young man's body floating in a swimming pool. The narrator explains, two shots in the back and one in the stomach. We then get a view from inside the pool, looking up at the man and the detectives taking photos. Who is it and why? Flashback time again. Down on his luck rider Joe Gillis, played by William Holden, is asking for money for his car note to no avail. He ends up on Sunset Boulevard, and so do the repo men. They give chase, and he gets ahead until his tire blows in the driveway of a lifeless mansion. The kind crazy movie people built in the crazy 20s. The repo men pass him unknowingly. We are introduced to Norma Desmond by way of long shot through the blinds. She's wearing sunglasses. As Joe enters, we see Max the Butler, played by Eric von Stroheim, an old silent movie director himself. Norma, played by an old silent actress, Gloria Swanson, is upstairs in all black with a dead monkey. Joe recognizes her. You used to be big. She replies, I am big. It's the pictures that got small. She's very crazy and very dramatic. She lives her movies, making intense gestures and always acting. She wants a funeral for the chimp. Now that's some eccentric Michael Jackson stuff right there, if you ask me. She sits in an expressionistic way, smoking a cigarette with a claw-like hand. And she's full of herself, in new age tropes like astrology and that sort. She was a huge star. Men paid off hairdressers for locks of her hair. A Maharaja begged from her a silk stocking and strangled himself with it. Cinema's first mention of autoerotic asphyxiation? Maybe. She ends up hiring Joe to help with a massive script in hopes of Cecil B. DeMille directing her in it. This starts off an unaffectionate love affair, and Joe, he gets trapped inside of it. He ends up being her kept boy after a failed New Year's Eve party that she throws just for the two of them. Joe storms out, meets Betty, they start falling in love, and Norma cuts her wrist. Great stars have great pride. And that's the main theme of the movie, Hollywood's treatment of their own people. Times change and Hollywood progresses with it. The old stars are forgotten, and some of them appear in this film. H.B. Warner, Ann Q. Nielsen, and even Buster Keaton are seen playing cards with Norma. Cecil B. DeMille, director of The King of Kings and The Ten Commandments, was still in Hollywood and was not yet done winning Oscars. In the film, he doesn't want her, but he feels guilty about it and tries to hide it. Hollywood wants her old car, not her. I'll buy him five cars to forget it. 
Norma is stuck in the past, but does do a great chaplain impersonation for Joe. And finally, we have the forgotten director, Eric von Stroheim, director of The Fantastic Greed from 1924. He's the butler and also Norma's first husband. His goal? To keep the outside world from Norma. He's probably listening to her screw Joe while he writes those fake fan letters. Now that's what I call dedication. Oh, man. Hollywood doesn't care, but we're here because we do, and I, for one, will never forget them. I love that Wilder made this film. It's exciting to see the seedy underbelly of an institution that is considered to be so magical and so glamorous. At least it was in the 50s. Today, we know that that is very far from the truth with big names being locked away in the countless sexual allegations, especially the ones coming from the kids. Oh, man. Come on, guys. Don't mess with the innocent. But to end on a happier note, check out some of Wilder's comedies, like One, Two, Three and Some Like It Hot. And try out some silent films. Start out with Chaplin's Modern Times or Buster Keaton's The General and go from there. You also got to remember that silent films aren't exactly all silent. There's always a musical score behind there, and a lot of them are very fun to watch, and the majority of them are a lot more visually striking than anything that's being made today. 